Um, one thing I think is interesting is this device here. I call it a sniffer. But I often find myself when I'm working on things, and let's say I have a bunch of wires running from one room to another, and I don't know because sometimes it's always inevitable that we always don't color code or mark our wires so we know which wire is which, that we end up with about 20 wires coming out in one room and we don't know which wire it is. That's where the sniffer comes in. A sniffer, and they use a lot of these in telephone circuits, you turn it on and it's making a signal. And this will locate that signal in space. Also, a lot of times I use this sniffer to tell me what's going on. It senses in all kinds of things, static electricity, like in my hair. Uh, if my computer is running at a certain frequency, that went out for a second. That's the scanning rate on that monitor on this computer. Hear it? That's the switching power supply. If I hear that sound, I know this computer has a good switching power supply. If I am near a fluorescent light, I can um, actually touch this and hear the sound from the fluorescent light. Some people have different sounds. Mark doesn't have a sound. But the circuits in here, I don't know if you can hear that. Okay? That will sometimes tell me if it's got a signal. I uh, often go to like um, circuits if I'm using a sniffer <clears throat> and I'm troubleshooting audio circuits. I'll go and I can poke around in that circuit and, and hear the signal if it's audio. Now, the neat thing though, let's say we're going from room to room and I have a whole bunch of wires and we don't get them tangled. Mark, would you take one of these? And you take the sniffer. It's got a button and we're, he's far away and I'm close by. I'm in another room. I'm sorry. Now, See if you can hear that signal way over there. It could be three, four hundred feet away. It'd still make that signal, and I could go through a whole pile of wires and find my one wire I'm looking for. Isn't that something? So I'm going to pass the sniffer around to you. Will it pick up a signal for a solar cell, such as a, a solar cell calculator? Well, that's an awfully low-level signal. But it probably will pick up this, the uh, microprocessor in the calculator running, test it and see. So you're only, you're only basically uh, sniffing, it, it's got lack of continuity. It's an inductor, it's a little inductive probe. And what it does is it picks up, our, it picks up magnetic fields in the environment, whatever the environment is. is. So okay. if, there, if there's a, a break in the wire, you wouldn't hear a sound? No. no. But as long as that conductor is carrying that signal, I'll be able to find it. But it's a great little test piece, like if you're working on a, if you're working on a printed circuit board and you want to find out what's going on in your printed circuit board, you can take your sniffer and go around on your printed circuit board and, and learn what things sound like, and it will tell you if it's working or not. Um, let's see. Um, I'm getting out of parts and I'm getting out of test equipment. I wanted to show you the one last thing. Does anybody know what this is? It's a hard drive in a computer. It's a platter that spins at a very high speed with a pickup and it picks up magnetic signals that are on the platter. But I just wanted to show that to you while we were at it. Pass that around. And while we're sort of still talking about connectors, I forgot to mention fiber optics. This is a fiber optic connector. It doesn't pass electrical signals at all, but it passes electromagnetic signals in the form of light down a light conductor. How about that? Um, moving along, the next thing I want to talk about is history. And I'm ending up with uh, Andresario Giuseppe Antonio Volta. 
And he was in Italy in 1786 was when he discovered the battery. Now, Andresario Volta, he's got an interesting story. All of his family were priests in the Catholic Church. And because they were all priests, they weren't having kids. And so his father had to leave the priesthood just to have kids. And they had, he had several kids, as, as I remembered. Most of them died because of disease, and he survived. And he was discovering that if you took acid, like sulfuric acid, and uh, you put dissimilar metals, in this case it was zinc and copper, the acid would eat the metals at a different rate. And you would create a potential difference between those two plates of metal. And that made an electric battery. It is a DC power source. Electric batteries come in thousands of configurations. But the chemical process is always that of metals being dissolved. One metal is being dissolved at a different rate than another metal. As this metal is being dissolved faster, it changes the atomic structure of that metal and the electron content changes, causing a potential difference between the two plates. A potential difference is what volts measure. Hang on a second. And so when we talk about voltage, what we're talking about is an electrical pressure caused by something. And you had a question? Yes, sir. That looks like a car battery. Yes, it is. And there's other types of batteries, such as the 9-volt, AAA, AA, etc. Um, and so you've talked about some materials, but what are the materials in the other batteries? What, how is, does the dissimilar metals, how are they constructed? Okay. There's thousands. There's thousands of different ones. And let's go over a few of the most common, okay? Like the car battery is a lead acid, sulfuric acid and lead. And they use, I think it's an oxidized lead and a pure lead, and they put the plates separated in, in sulfuric acid. And because of the acid eating one plate a little bit differently than the other, it creates a potential difference, which can create a large current flow. Uh, we have nickel cadmium batteries, which are basically rechargeables. We have mercury batteries, and there's thousands of kinds, and they, they make them for their various needs. And the, the batteries are designed to produce one thing, like a car battery, you need a very high current flow. You have to have a lot of current in that electron current flow coming from that battery to have the force or the power to turn your engine over to get it started. Whereas the battery, like in a cell phone or a watch, it doesn't need to produce a lot of current, <coughs> but it needs to produce a steady flow of uh, DC that these devices can depend on. And, you know, and so batteries basically are chemical devices where some acidic substance reacts with two dissimilar metals to produce a voltage a and then a consequent current flow. One of the ones I find most interesting we used to do when we were kids was a citrus cell. You take a lemon and you stick a copper, a copper penny in one, well, you, you squeeze the lemon so it's got a lot of liquid in it, stick a copper penny in one side, stick a nickel in the other, you can get 1.5 volts. And you put those together in parallel, you can run your transistor radio. But that's basically what batteries are. And you notice the symbol for a battery is this one right here. Right there, that's a symbol for a battery. The positive side is the one with the big plate. The negative side is the one with the little plate. Any more questions on batteries? OK. I'm going to bring in James Watt real quickly. James Watt was, uh, we were talking about Andesario Volta. So we come up with the concept of the volt, right? We were talking about the volt. Now we're going to talk about the watt, OK? And basically, Watt was a, a guy who made steam engines. But he, he has an, his name was used for the watt representing electrical power because he came up with the theories on power and what it takes to make something perform a certain amount of work. And so that's what they called the watt a after. And if you look at the formula for watts, watt is represented by the symbol P. P is equal to watts is equal to volts times amps. 
So if I have 10 volts times 10 amps, how many watts do I have? Anybody? 100. Okay? And so whenever I make this symbol here, like one of these triangles, that's a way of helping me remember the formula a little easier. If the P is at the top, then it's this times that. If it's this over that, then it's a division. So watts equals volts times amps. Amps equals volts equals watts divided by volts. Volts equals watts divided by amps. That's part of Ohm's law. But I brought him up just so if anybody says, well, how much is a 100 watt light bulb? Well, if I have 110 volts uh, in my voltage and I can use these formulas to determine what the resistance is and so forth. And then we get the amps. 1806, Andre Marie Ampere in France. Very sad story. He was during the French Revolution. And uh, he was doing a lot of scientific research in current flow and so forth. Problem was, um, everybody in his family was getting guillotined to death. His father was guillotined, his wife was guillotined later. And so he had a very sorrowful life. But between all that trouble, he uh, did the theory that we brought up as current flow. And he did a lot of work on electromagnetic radiation. And so when I use the term amp, amp is defining a current, electrical current, which is an amount of electrons flowing through a wire. Sometimes they use the term coulomb for that too, in a little bit different way. Faraday, Michael Faraday, he is the one they named capacitance after. So when I say it's a farad, I'm talking about a unit of capacitance. And when I get a capacitor like this, this capacitor here is a thousand microfarad capacitor. So that's the unit of capacitance. That tells me the amount of charge this capacitor will hold. Um, and so that's where farad came from. The very first capacitors were laden jars. It was a, a glass jar. They coat the outside with a foil. They coat the inside with a foil. And a capacitor is whenever you have two plates and an insulator. And these glass jars hold very large charges. And if they could shock you. Uh, same thing with a picture tube, a television picture tube. Big glass jar, big glass thing has a plate on the outside, plate on the inside, it can hold a very large charge. Even if the TV's been turned off for days, you can still get quite a shock off of it. Any questions? Yeah. Um, yes, sir, I was just thinking you were talking about uh, glass insulators. They used to have glass insulators that they put on top of telephone poles. Yeah. yeah. And so was that for the same purpose? Yes, absolutely. The, the question was, what about the glass insulators that were on telephone poles? And you know, those are getting right, quite popular right now, some of those pretty little blue glass insulators that are, and they were mainly used with telegraph wires. And um, they came out with a single wire telegraph and they'd be sending signals from one place to another. And they, you had to have it so that if it rained, that you wouldn't short your signal to ground through the wet wood. And so the glass was a good insulator and they had it designed where water would drop off. Also, if you had a higher voltage, which saw somewhere higher voltage, it wouldn't short out if, it got, if the pole got wet. And so that's why they had those big glass insulators.